On a personal note, I, uh, I met Mr. Pertman when he allowed me to intern with the Evan B. Donaldson Institute when I was working on my master's in New York. And from the moment I met him, he just exuded so much zeal and passion. You could, you could really tell that he really cares about adoption. And always seeing him in and out of the office, you see his dedication. And he really uh, works tirelessly uh, for adoption. And I think that's just such a, an admirable thing about him. Um, I'm also introducing uh, Ms. Mary Fournier, and uh, she's the Domestic Adoption Program Manager for Wide Horizons for Children Incorporated, and she's had that position for three years. She's a licensed clinical uh, social worker, and she earned her Master's of Social Work degree from the University of Connecticut School of Social Work in 1995 after uh, what she calls a life-changing trip to China. Her interest in social work and her interest in China both led her to the adoption field, where she has been for f over 15 years, um, 13 of which have been with uh, Wide Horizons. She's conducted various workshops on topics including clinical issues in adoption and homeland travel. Um, and since joining the Wide Horizons staff, she's gotten to travel to China multiple times as well as Ethiopia to assist adoptive parents in being united with their children. And uh, I think being in touch with adoption on that real level with families and adoptees and supporting them um, and understanding their experiences is um, so vital to keeping our field uh, relevant and uh, meaningful. She also has a personal tie to adoption as she's the adoptive mother of two, two girls, Olivia, age 11, and Jenna, age 8, and they're both of Guatemalan heritage. So we're really excited that they're here today. Please join me in welcoming both Mr. Pertman and Ms. Fournier. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, you know how you come to every session hoping to glean new information, new insights, new understanding from the research? You're not going to get that here. <laughs> the truth is that in this realm, you know, we, we rarely invent any wheels. We find new research, new ways of thinking about things and so forth. Um, in this realm, in the world of the, the internet, we're just figure, starting to figure it out. I was giving a presentation akin to this um, at a law conference in, um, in Ohio a few weeks ago, and I start off by saying, just remember, we're making all of this up. <laughs> and I think every speaker after me said something about, you know, we really are, you know, it, 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 the wall came down. And we are. Um, there's an extent to which that's, uh, the greatest extent to which that's really true. Um, I will tell you that the Adoption Institute trying to fill this gap has started a, um, a three-year project, may last longer, depending on funding, but um, a three-year project we plan to publish once a year for each of the next three years because I think, because there's nothing. Um, and so we want to help fill that void. One of the ways we're going to do it, because you can't do a lit review here, uh, you can't do a practice review here, uh, you'll get stories, but you won't get anything other than stories. Um, anyway, um, so one of the ways in which we want to gather information is through all of you. So wherever I speak on this topic, I show the following. Take a look at that bottom uh, email address. I created it so that people in the field, people with personal experiences, parents, anybody, could write to us and say, here's what happened to me. Or in practice, here's what we found is working. Or here's what we found is not working. This is really from the ground up. And so we need and want your help. Internet Project AI, that's for Adoption Institute, obviously, at gmail.com. I urge you, I ask you to please participate in this. It will be really helpful. And I will say, just because I have to, because of my job, that if you know anybody who wants to fund work like this, because I think it is really, truly life-changing, and that's going to be the thrust of my presentation today. Um, I think this is probably as important 
and probably more important than any single development in the history of adoption. Now, you could probably make that argument for the, the Internet's effect in lots of realms, but this is our realm. And it's going to happen, and the, the impact already is significant, and it is going to do nothing but grow from here on in, and we have no knowledge base from which to act. Okay, with that, so those of you who don't know the Adoption Institute, I'll just, I'm not going to read all these slides to you, just to quickly introduce you to it. This is our mission. These are our principles and values. While you read those, I want to just tell you that um, someone handed out um, sign-up sheets on, all the, on most, if not all, the tables. Those are for our newsletter. That's all it's for. It's a terrific newsletter. I was a journalist for 25 years. Turns out I was in training to put out a newsletter. Uh, but it, it's a very good newsletter. It's re genuinely useful. I urge you all to sign up. Um, and that's on your table. The other thing is I want to do a really quick plug. Club, plug, plug. I didn't say I could talk. Um, if um, among the, and this just uh, to give you a sense of what we do, um, among the uh, projects that we currently have going is one is developing best practice standards for a camp for adopted kids. There are lots of camps for adopted kids. This is a, a new and different model. It's called Camp Clio. It'll be in Connecticut this year. We're not running it or anything. We're doing the, the research base for it and developing um, the, what the kids are going to do that will help in adoption while they're having fun. You get the picture. Anyway, um, there are postcards here. Um, I'm going to put them somewhere on the table down there, if you would grab them. And if anybody's interested, please do. Otherwise, otherwise no, it's, if you go online, it's campclio.org, okay? And this, I'll tell you a quick joke to, to launch us into this discussion. It'll explain a little about the Institute and about what I'm going to talk to you about today. And some of you have heard this, forgive me. Uh, it's very fast. Um, a mom could be a dad. Mom takes her son, could be a daughter, uh, to his first football game and afterwards says, so what did you think? How'd you like it? And the kid says, I loved it. It was great. I loved when they threw the ball around and they ran all over the field and they jumped on top of each other. It was so cool. But why all that fuss about 25 cents? And the mom says, what are you talking about? Kid says, you know, at the beginning, they threw a coin up in the air and the whole time after that, it's get the quarterback, get the quarterback. And the point is, and there's a point, that if no one ever explains the rules to you, if no one tells you who the players are, if no one explains how it works, and God bless people like Hal Grotevant and a lot of you in this room, because that's what you really do, isn't it? You explain how it works. You explain who the players are. It's what the Institute does through the work that it does. It's a simple way of understanding what research is all about. It explains what's in front of our very eyes. Because if we don't understand it, we don't understand what's happening in front of our very eyes. I think adoption, as much as any institution in America, because of its history of secrecy and shame and stigma, is subject to so many problems and misconceptions that are born of people not knowing what they see, who the players are. So that's what we try to do. And I think that nothing could be more, more apt to describe the role of the internet. We really don't know, do we? We think maybe. I've seen lots of webinars and I've gone to presentations about adoption the internet. Have you, some of you have done the same. Um, I'll leave it at, we still don't know a lot. And so we have work to do. So I start almost every presentation with this Alex Haley quote because we have to remember who we do what we do for. Um, when Alex Haley wrote, everybody remembers Roots, right? And the whole country shook its head up and down in unison saying, yeah, that's true for everybody. And there was no asterisk that said, except for adopted people. But for generations, we acted as though there was that asterisk, right? So one thing that the internet, and that's all changing, that's all good, and if anybody hasn't read our new openness paper, go to our website. Um, it, it pretty much illustrates that you know the the era of the secrets is dwindling away, and it's a wonder that's that part is a good thing, um, but it also means that more people are indeed going to know who they are and where they came from, and I think 
there is no instrument that will accelerate that more quickly than the internet. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. What role will the internet play in us knowing about, about each other? I would say, anybody have any questions that it will be significant? The only question is how significant and what do we do about it? So I'm not going to go through all of this because I don't have a lot of time. Um, some of you have heard me present before know that I go through this because it, the illustration is just to show where is the baseline knowledge that we all have, even people in the field. Where is the baseline knowledge? And I will tell you, most audiences get most of it wrong. Some audiences do better than others. It's not meant to embarrass anybody. It's meant to illustrate how much do we really know going in. So how many children are adopted each year? I'm just going to give quick answers, because the, and I'll lead to the point about the internet. So um, it's about 135,000, including step-parent adoptions of, and adoptions of all kinds in the next question. Um, which types of adoption occur most? The hands I get at most audiences are whichever new, news story they heard last. And that's the biggest number. If it's an ado international adoption story, that must be it. If it's an infant adoption story, that must be it. Um, anyway, the answer is by, well, I'll get to the answer because it's the next slide. Um, how many Americans have adoption their immediate family? I think this is vitally important to understand. Vitally important because we think of adoption as parents and children. If you went out into, into the real world and asked what's adoption, they'd say, you know, when the, parents have, the parent gets the kid. Well, that means we don't think about birth families. That means we don't think about siblings. That means we don't think about grandparents and aunts and uncles. You think they're affected? <laughs> so we pigeonhole ourselves into a niche this big, and that's how people perceive us. Because it's just about the parent and child, right? Well, then it's not that big a number. But when you do the multiplication, and I can do it, but I'm not going to do it for you here. But when you do the multiplication, you get to easily 100 million people with adoption in their immediate family, parents, grandparents, siblings, uncles, aunts. And by the way, this is really a, a revelation. Adopted people grow up. And they have children. And they get older and they have grandchildren and nephews and nieces. When you add up the immediate family, you get to at least 100 million. And that doesn't include the birth families and the foster families and the teachers who teach our kids you think they have some impact, and the kids who go to school with our kids, and the social workers, and on and on. And so you just keep growing. So the little niche is a really big community. And how we think about that and how we portray ourselves, if we understand it that way, makes a real difference. And when we talk about the impact of the internet, again, if we think about it, oh, well, you know, all these kids, you know, they'll go find their birth parents. And that's, you know, it's important to the families, but it's this. And then you rethink it and say, oh, my God. <laughs> Look at all the people who are affected. And it's huge. So we're talking about a subject that will affect tens of millions of people just in our community. And by the way, I did forget to say this. Um, the subtitle here is a critical part of rethinking adoption in the 21st century. I don't know how much of that I will get into, but my premise and when the senior fellows and I met yesterday, I went sort of through this. My premise, the premise is that Adoption in the 21st century is radically different than how it began. It began as infant adoption, you know, white unmarried women, their babies uh, adopted by, um, their white babies adopted by white married couples. Anybody think that's adoption in America today? But the laws, policies, practices, the platform on which we operate, from which we operate, is that platform. So I'm suggesting that we have to rethink what we're doing here, who we're serving here, who the players are, what the rules should be. Um, and, and I'll leave it at that for the moment, um, but adoption on the internet is one of those big radical changes that promises to take, the, take what we've already got, which is very different, and push it even further out. Okay, so this is what's happening in international adoption. I, I'm gonna zoom through this. Um, this is what's happening in foster care adoptions. 
So the number of, so the answer to the question above here is how, um, what types of adoption occur most. Almost everybody gets this wrong, including social work audiences, is foster care adoptions are the biggest numbers by far, uh, followed right now by domestic infant adoptions because international adoptions are plummeting. That would have been flopped a short while ago. And uh, the last one is just for fun, depending on the audience, when is contact with birth family a positive? And the answer is that you know, openness and adoption is taking hold. People can like it, dislike it, it's true. And when it's contact with birth family a positive, we better wrap our heads around how to make it positive rather than whether it is because the internet is going to obliterate the barriers, is already doing it. So, which has huge implications in, in lots of ways. So here's where we, in, in fact, are. Um, child welfare adoptions <coughs> are, you know, by, by big magnitudes, the, the biggest numbers. And again, just to get you thinking a little bit about what does that mean for adoption per se, what is this rethinking of adoption in the 21st century. Um, Inter-country adoptions, you see those numbers, you see child welfare adoptions. Um, those of you who heard, heard Susan Smith, on our staff earlier today, heard a little bit of this. I'll reframe it a little. It means 73%, three quarters of the adoptions in America are of children, this is stark, who are abused, neglected, or institutionalized. And if you think that other 17% of infants is little white babies born to white unwed mothers uh, adopted by white married couples, then you are not paying attention because it's gay people and lesbians and single people and cohabitating people, people of color and older parents and the kids are not white babies, all white babies. So it's a very different world and we're operating from a platform that was built for something else. Uh, this, uh, the importance, so why is all of this important? This is the importance of, this is from our study called uh, Beyond Culture Camp and I'm really zooming. How much time do I have? Oh, no, no, I'm not leaving. Okay, the importance of adoptive identity, this is really important. Um, racial ethnic idea, this is, identity, this is really important. Um, this is a brief history of Adoption America. This is getting us to where we are today. I'm not gonna go through it. Anybody wants this uh, PowerPoint, just let me know. You'll get it, or I can give it to Hal and he can shoot it to all. To, uh, just sign up for the thing and I'll send it to you. Just put your name that you want PowerPoint. Um, so we, we have moved to a radically different place um, where we are, and this is where we are today. Very few voluntary placements by people of color or white folks. Um, I, the, that first one is in red, adoption day is still commonly understood as child placement. It's a big mistake. If we don't start thinking about adoption as being a family thing, an extended family thing, then we leave out a lot of people in policy and practice and in our understandings and attitudes. Um, okay, so how profound will the Internet's impact be on openness and on adoption? Um, I'll, let, I'll let you digest it for a few minutes. Um, the, the answer is that we don't know yet, but there appears to be, to me, and I've been working on this, thinking about this, gathering information on this for, I don't know, better part of a year, um, it seems to me that you can't underestimate what impact it might have. Not on everybody. You know, there are people who will still have closed adoptions, infant adoptions, but it'll be dumb luck that it'll be closed because it'll mean that neither the, the first mom or the grown adoptee wants to look because if they want to look, they're going to find. So it's going to be more voluntary. Uh, so the good and the bad and the ugly, I see three big buckets, three big areas in which this will have really profound impact. One is on adoption practice, and I'll just jump here. So what's happening out there on adoption practice? Um, who here works for a, a sort of traditional adoption agency? Okay, how many people are gonna come to you when they can go online and find a baby on average within three to 12 months. And we'll connect you with states where birth parents cannot revoke consent. Good luck, staying in business. 
How can they promise this? What's going on behind the scenes? And is it real? On the internet, I can become an adoption practitioner tomorrow. All I have to do is build a website. Oh my God. So for practice, it means a lot, and it's on all sides, right? The, the, first, ha the first couple lines are for, to the pre-adopted parents, and look what's happening with, on the internet with pregnant women. Come give us your baby. We have financial aid available and free housing. Oh my God. So that's what's happening um, in practice, and the implications are massive. But that's bucket one in practice, and you can add to this list a lot, a lot of examples. Um, what I mean in the courts, most adoptions are from foster care, right? I'm just going to give you a couple quick examples. Now, when the kid is placed in foster care, usually in a foster adopt situation, right? The judge makes rules. You can see this person, you cannot see your brother, you can have, there are these restrictions and these are these rules. And then Mary, who was told she can't see her brother because he's dangerous, um, goes home and gets on, on Facebook and sees her brother. And they agree to meet next Tuesday at the bowling alley. Oh my God. So what are, the, what are we doing in the courts? I don't think we have begun to wrap our heads around this. And just one other example, so then Mary's adopted, right? And she was put in foster care because her father abused and neglected her. Let's just say sexually abused her, right? And Mary's on, Mary's 13 now, 14, she's healing. She's been in her home a few years and she's doing great. And she gets on Facebook and there's dad saying, hi Mary, I really miss you. Oh my God, Mary's re-traumatized. Do we have a clue? And then there's, there's search and reunion, and a lot of this is really good. I'm a fan, usually. <laughs> but is there counseling? Is there guidance? And there's a lot of search and reunion that's, you know, to, you, what, do you got to be 12 to be on Facebook? No, you don't have to be 12 on, to be on Facebook. You just have to check that you're 12 to be on Facebook. Right? Anyway, there are all over the country, every single day, people reuniting with their siblings, with their birth parents, birth parents finding their kids, and the parents and the adoptive parents don't even know. Relationships are being formed. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this. Sometimes you shouldn't, sometimes you shouldn't. But without knowledge, without guidance, without anything. Um, and there, I don't, it's not, this not a one-sided deal, lots of good stuff. Lots of good resources, opportunities to conduct research, support groups, lots of good stuff. But we don't know what we're doing there either. And what else is an open invitation for all of you to write and tell us? Um, so this is a list of ethical practices. I think we would all agree there are others, um, but I sort of put together what we think is good, pretty good practice. Anybody want to take any bet? I'll take any bet you want on whether the people putting their practice, the, I don't mean traditional agencies that have internet sites, but some of those sites I showed before, you think they've gone through all of the ethical considerations and tried to incorporate them into their practices? <laughs> maybe, maybe some have. But is there any mechanism? Is there any way to guard against it? Is there any way to educate people? Is there anything? I guess that wasn't a good question because nobody answered it. So what's happening out there? I listed, how much time have I got? Nothing, okay. So what's happening out there is all kinds of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we don't have a clue. We're trying. And so um, how hard is it to find someone? You know, those ads that say you can find your high school classmate, guess what? You can find more than your high school classmate and it's happening every day. And there are stories and stories like this. Again, it's the good stuff and the bad stuff. I promise I'm going to wrap up in a minute. But it gives you a sense. Um, so how big a deal is it? I think, I think, based on what I can figure out, the traditional adoption practices at financial risk. I think the era of secrecy and closure, for good or worse, because there, there are going to be some bad things that happen. 
and there are going to be some wonderful things. But that era, it, it, we found in our, the paper we released last week in, the, in that research that 5%, 5% of all adoptions in America being uh, started today are closed, 5%. You don't have to go very far back when it was 100%. The trend line is fairly clear. But that era for that five, any adoption practitioner who tells that pregnant woman in her office that don't worry, no one will ever know, needs to be sued for malpractice. That's what the internet means. Anybody who, any adoption practitioner who isn't preparing pre-adoptive parents for possible contact, reunion, communication, is to be kind, not paying attention. It means our practices have to change. It, mean, it means a lot of things. And it means that the era of the extended family of adoption, a phrase I've been trying to coin for 10 years, um, is on us. These, pe these people on both sides are going to be part of the family. They are. You may not like it. You may not like them. Or you may. But we have to prepare ourselves for the reality that is and not for the one we imagine or the one for which that initial platform was built. So what, we, what do we need? We need research. We need to develop information. There are laws that are going to have to be changed. There are probably internet privacy stuff we're going to have to deal with. This, th that's why this is starting as, starting as a three-year project with publications every year because there is that much to do. Um, and, the, and those of you who get this, there are some suggestions. What can you do within your family to, in the interim to deal with the internet? Um, what can you do on your computer dealing with your kids? What resources are out there? Um, and this last slide is what I really think is the bigger picture into which the internet fits. What are the big changes going on out there? What should we be doing? How do we re-envision and rebuild an institution that's really important to tens of millions of people so that it is in today's world? Because it is built on yesterdays. Um, so when I've, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap now. So some of you have seen this already. When I finished writing my book, uh, adoption Nation, the subtitle which is How the Adoption Revolution is Transforming Our Families and America. Pretty audacious claim, huh? Um, so I finished the, and I, how do you encapsulate that in an introduction? Which is what I, and I grappled, I, I'll make it quick, I couldn't do it. I, I just couldn't write it and then a cartoon popped into my head, I can't draw. It serves as the introduction to my book. It's a pregnant woman at a party and the couple is saying to her, oh, I'm sorry, you couldn't adopt? We can laugh at that for two reasons. One, adoptive parents turns adoption, it, the, turns the, the phrase on its head, right? Oh, I'm sorry, you couldn't have any real children. Our kids look real. My kids look real. I don't know about yours. Um, but more important, and the reason I used it was because I think that X number of years ago, X being a pretty small number, people would have looked at this and said, what are you talking about? We shouldn't make babies. What's your point? We can laugh at it now because something fundamental has changed. We did something really big in the adoption world. From zero to, from 100% close to 5% through work like Hal's and lots of other people's, we, people, we have transformed this institution and it does affect hundreds of millions of people, 100 million people. That's a really big social change. That is a really big thing we did. So I leave you with the understanding that if we could do that, last sentence, we can do this. We can wrap our heads around this and get it right, but it is gonna take a real effort and real work to do it, but I hope that I gave you some sense of what I think the stakes are. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mary Fournier. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the personal aspect of Facebook and adoption, how it affects individuals and families. Adam and I, when we were putting this workshop together, we talked about him sort of taking the larger sort of policy view. Um, I want to bring you down into the family and talk with you about what's going on and what we're seeing in the field. Um, as of my most recent search on the internet, I found that there are approximately 
This is just an estimate based on last December's figures, but that there are over 750 million users of Facebook at this time. I think that's almost unbelievable. And how do you even put that number into a context? So this is what I thought to myself. The number one largest country in the world is China with 1.4 billion people. The second largest country is India with 1.2 billion people. But if you add up the third, fourth, and fifth largest countries in the world, they don't even equal as many people that are using Facebook at this time. That's equals 740 million. So the population of Facebook is huge and it's global and it is impacting adoption in many, many ways. How many people in the room use the internet? Just the internet. Anybody not use the internet? Yeah, it's so prevalent in our lives. What do you use on the internet? Call out maybe what some of the social networking sites that you use are. LinkedIn, LinkedIn yep. Of course, Facebook, that's obvious. Twitter, MySpace. MySpace? <laughs> you don't have to tell us your age, it's okay. <laughs> These are just some of, the, some of the websites that are being used as social networking sites, search engines like MySpace. How about YouTube is something I know my children are on. I have two children who love YouTube. My Life, Twitter, um, and who's, who's in adoption? Who's using the internet? Well, this is what we're finding. Pregnant women are looking for adoptive families on the internet. Um, adoptive families are looking for birth families on the internet and sometimes hovering over their Facebook pages and spying on them. Adoptive families do that even though we might not like to admit that. Adoption agencies are using the internet. Child welfare professionals are using the internet. Used to be that we didn't have access to the internet at, at the office. And now we can go on very easily and access the internet for our clients to find resources and all kinds of things. People are looking for surrogates on the website, on the, on the internet. Um, they're looking for donors, expectant parents. Most importantly, what we're finding is that kids are looking for their birth families on the internet. Talk about obliterating the barriers. The internet has obliterated the barriers to birth families. What do they find when they go on the internet? Well, all kinds of interesting things are out there. People's personal stories about adoption in vivid detail. P adoptive parents love to blog and tell all their stories about what they went through to get their child. There are songs on the internet about adoption. There are adoptive parent profiles on the internet. How to do an adoption is on the internet. The costs of adoption, everything that you pay for what, what you get in adoption, political commentary about adoption. And if you're an adoptee, the world is open to you as far as information that's out there. So who is being found? What, is, what, what else are, are, are people finding? Well, people finding are, are finding birth parents, of course, birth siblings, extended family. They're finding other adoptees. Um, or other adopted adults, support groups, chat rooms, blogs, which can all be helpful. They're finding one of the biggest concerning things is that uh, internet users are finding information that could destabilize them. We're seeing this with adoptees over and over, that the information that they're finding is destabilizing in their lives. Um, they're also finding information that can fuel their fantasies. They're finding pictures and all kinds of things. And who can find them? Who can find adoptees on the internet? Well, birth parents, birth siblings, extended family, other adopted children or adults. So what's the impact of this on our, on our clients and on our families? Well, we know this is a problem because it's a threat to families. It's causing destabilization in families. But it's important to remember that not all birth family contact presents risks. Some of it can be positive and some of it can be informative and helpful. Traditionally, social workers go to enormous lengths to protect children placed with adoptive families from inappropriate contact with families. In traditional placements, reunions don't usually occur until the child is 18. State laws specify this in some ways. Um, search generally involves a great deal of preparation and communication through a third party. Often it's meant to protect the confidentiality of the parties involved, to offer support to the parties involved. And Facebook circumvents all of this. Fantasies of um, birth parents are held by adoptees. This is a vulnerability that adoptees have that can be exploited very easily. 
connections are made and information is received without adequate support and preparation. Um, connections happen very quickly and they move quickly before the child is ready and even before the adults in the child's life know what is happening. So the situation can get quickly out of hand. Kids become destabilized by the information that they receive and they often put themselves in danger. Many of these children that we're working with in the adoption field were maltreated possibly abused, possibly neglected, all of which impair their emotional, physical, psychological, cognitive, and spiritual development, which we've seen today and which we talked about, we heard our keynote speaker discuss this morning. Birth families are really generally not in a place to acknowledge the reason why children were removed in the first place, and in many cases, the circumstances that these children are finding when they contact their birth family are still in full-blown um, these situations haven't changed that their birth families are living in. Um, the, the birth family may in fact be in denial about the issues. They may um, be unable to acknowledge the reasons why the child was originally removed from care. And um, we're seeing that this can definitely re-traumatize a child. Adam mentioned the young woman who found and adopted her birth father online who was abusive to her and we're seeing that this is happening, that there are people out there, predators who are locating their birth children and who are re-traumatizing them. Um, the age of 14 to 15 is, most, is a very vulnerable time for children, um, but what happens when the children get to be 16, 17, 18 is they fall off of our radar as child welfare professionals, so we don't know what's happening with them. It's concerning. Uh, these, these children are in touch with their birth families who were abusive to them. Um, and equally concerning is that they're seeking birth family without support in place, that their adoptive parents don't know that they're seeking their birth family or that they're reaching out. Um, and additionally, birth families are seeking their, their children that they place for adoption without supports in place for them either. And many birth parents, birth mothers, birth fathers are vulnerable people as well. Um, I think that adoptive parents have a feeling of ownership of the adoptee. They feel that the child is every bit their child and that introduction of the birth parents can be disruptive to this um, sense of ownership that adoptive families have and adoptive families are struggling with that. Adoptive parents rightfully worry about the impact of, the, of this on their relationship with the child. So what can we do to help? What do we do about this? Because in some ways, it's an animal that's out of the cage. And in some ways, what we're doing is playing catch up, as Adam mentioned, because we don't even know the implications of the internet on our children. Uh, we want to advise and support our families. We want to assess the risks that are involved. Of course, we want to protect children and young people from being re-traumatized or destabilized. We want to manage the complex situations that arrive from the unplanned and unmediated contact. We want to encourage ongoing communication between parents and children so there's a higher likelihood that children will be comfortable telling their parents if they are contacted. I think that's really crucial that we have to, have to encourage adoptive parents to be communicative with their children about what could happen to them, that they could be found on the internet. We have to alert kids to the possibility that they could be found. This has to be an open conversation. I know working with adoptive families that so many people wonder about openness. What level of openness am I going to have? How am I going to handle openness? And many adoptive families don't feel prepared to talk with their adopted child about their adoption. They feel uncomfortable about it. It makes them uncomfortable. Uh, we, you know, we talk about how the message that we give children non-verbally can impact how they relate to us. I think it's important to talk with our families about internet safety. I once heard an analogy that allowing your child to go out on the internet by themselves is sort of like allowing them to go to the local playground without you. And I think that's really true. If you think about that, you would never send your child down the street on their own to go to the playground. And so you have to think of the internet as a playground. And how are you going to escort your child through the internet? What are you going to do to help them? Um, I do have a sheet on the top 10 tips of managing social media that's put out by the British organization um, that's working with foster children in, in England, and they have some good tips on uh, managing social media. Um, there are parental control websites, of course. 
But how many people know what their children are doing on the internet? Are you involved with your child and what they're doing on the internet? That's extremely important. Uh, Adoptive Families Magazine, the January-February issue of Adoptive Families Magazine had some good tips on the internet and how to um, keep your child safe. And also it's important to remember that there is an electronic footprint that's out there that you can follow to see what your child has done, where they've gone, what sites they've looked at. Um, it's important to be involved and to know what they're doing. But what else can we do to help? We can ask our families about their involvement with social networking, talk about it. You'd be amazed at how many people don't really know what to do on Facebook or, or, or how to get on Facebook or why do I even want to get on Facebook. But what do, what do your adoptive families know about their child's involvement with social networking. Talk to them about it. Don't be afraid to talk to your child about it. Address social networking in post-adoption um, agreements. When we place children with adoptive families, we create open adoption agreements or open adoption contracts. Are we addressing the internet in those agreements? Are we talking at all with families about um, the internet is going to be playing a part in your child's adoption? Your child may be looking for their birth family on the internet. I think most importantly, we have to encourage our families to talk with children before it happens so they're not playing catch up. We already feel like how do we stay ahead of this thing? It's gotten out of the bag. We don't know how to do it. But if we can get our families talking to children about social networking, I think that will help to prevent the shock of it happening if we can just try to stay a little bit of a step ahead of it. Um, adoptive parents need to show their child that they're open to talking about adoption and birth family. As hard as that is for adoptive families, we have to get comfortable with talking to our children about their birth families. We used to tell people when we were preparing them for adoption, when your child comes home, no matter how old they are, start saying the word birth family to them. Not so that your child will hear it, but so that you'll get used to saying it, so that it will be on your tongue and it will be practiced and it won't sound stiff and uncomfortable coming out of your mouth. We need to create life books with our children. For the people that were here before with David Brodzinski, he was talking about creating life books with children. That's another way to make adoption talkable. That's another way to, to, to talk about the issues and to talk about the story and the history and where your child comes from. I think I'm going to stop there and maybe open it up to questions. Great.